and welcome you to the fall conference of the Council of American Ambassadors, fall 2023 conference. It is good to see a new arrival uh, as a uh, uh, participant, an in-person participant in our, our proceedings. Um, it's probably unwise to say in front of uh, an audience uh, too much about what goes on behind the curtain uh, in putting something like this together, but I will say a bit about that here for our studio audience, so to speak, those who are participating in person, for the benefit of those who are online, and for posterity as well, because we're going to be recording these uh, the, a few hours together uh, with our speakers and posting uh, this proceeding uh, as uh, a uh, uh, podcast, I guess you could say, to the council's website, where it will be available to a wider audience. Uh, but uh, in our previous conferences, uh, certainly the ones in 2022, um, we had covered the war in Ukraine and the war in Ukraine again with the possibility of a conflict breaking out with China over Taiwan. Uh, so having covered uh, the wars that were then uh, either active or in view and sort of run out of wars, uh, we thought for the purposes of this type, this conference, uh, to focus on uh, a big potential element of future conflict, which is cyber war, war not yet upon us, or an element of warfare that we've seen uh, employed in some conflicts, but that has never really uh, emerged or full-blown uh, uh, and been launched on the world. Uh, then another war happened uh, to break out in the Middle East. And so we have today uh, Aaron David Miller speaking not on cyber warfare at our lunch, but on the conflict in the Middle East. But most of our morning, our morning is essentially going to be uh, devoted to the topic of cyber warfare, which was predicated, as I said, on kind of running out of hot wars. And to kick off that discussion, we are honored and privileged this morning to have with us Brandon Wales, who is the executive director, the first executive director of CISA. Those of us who've been in the national security community for a while, probably mastered almost all, if not all, of Washington's alphabet soup of acronyms. Uh, so naturally, CISA rolls easily off the tongue and you know exactly what it stands for, but it's really a uh, relatively recent creation, five years old now, uh, and it is the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency. Now, a self-standing agency within, I believe it's correct to say, within the Department of Homeland Security, uh, of which Brandon is the first executive director. Uh, he brings to this role a very uh, interesting and exciting background. Last year, with the outbreak of the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, he was put in charge of uh, the federal response to preparedness for this, a, a, any cybersecurity threat to the United States uh, that might emerge from that conflict or be a follow-on to that conflict. So he has uh, been leading the Unified Coordination Group uh, to ensure the unity of effort within the federal government, um, uh, building government-wide strategic objectives and identifying and resolving gaps in operations and interagency coordination in the event that such an attack, such a, a threat would emerge. Before that, uh, 2020 and 2021, he, in the role of acting director of CISA, Brandon uh, had responsibility for coordinating CISA's response to that series of high profile and widely publicized cyber attacks and ransomware attacks 
that you see. Headlines like the solar winds, Orion supply chain attacks, the Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities, the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack, uh, the Pulse Connect Secure vulnerabilities, and the Cassia VSA supply chain uh, ransomware attack, among others. From August, from 2017 to 2019, he was in the headship of the Department of Homeland Security as Deputy Chief of Staff, as Acting Chief of Staff, and as Chief of Staff. With all of this experience and having grown up now with CISA uh, from its creation, um, he brings us a wealth of He's uh, received awards. Uh, uh, the Exceptional Performance Award from the Director of National Intelligence, the Department of Homeland Security Secretary's Award for Excellence, and two DHS Distinguished Service Medals. He began his career pre-DHS as uh, uh, an aide, national security aide, Senator John Kyle, and holds his bachelor's degree from George Washington University and his master's degree from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies both institutions well known to us in Washington. And we decided we were going to do this as an interview. So I will endeavor uh, to pose uh, provocative and uh, uh, questions that elicit insights for you about CISA, its role in cybersecurity and cyber warfare, and about cybersecurity generally. So to get us started, I've already talked about CISA as an outgrowth of the Department of Homeland Security, could you tell us more, Brandon, about how CISA evolved within DHS uh, into a self-standing agency? Sure. So first, uh, Ambassador, thank you for, for the invitation to talk to you and to the entire group uh, about such a critical issue at a critical time. Um, so as you noted, CISA is five years old as a, um, as a operational element of the department. Uh, we started with the department in 2003 as a element of the headquarters of DHS uh, that was focused at the time on largely providing guidance and support associated with physical infrastructure security issues. Again, in the wake of 9-11, this was primarily focused on counterterrorism, um, helping us be prepared to make sure that our infrastructure was protected against Al-Qaeda and other threats. Uh, so I started in the department in 2005 in April, and a few months later, we had the London subway attacks in July of that year. And so I think that helps to help to kind of galvanize exactly what we were trying to prevent here in the homeland and make sure that we were, we were ready. But that mission has evolved substantially over the past uh, 18 plus years. Uh, later in 2005, we had Hurricane Katrina demonstrating the importance of critical infrastructure uh, and its resilience in the face of massive uh, damage from a natural hazard. Um, and over the years, as the threats to our critical infrastructure have evolved, uh, so have we. And today, obviously, the cyber aspects of our mission uh, kind of dwarf some of the others. But uh, you know, if we get to discussing later um, some of the uh, uh, our reaction and our response to the violence in the Middle East, um, the work that we do supporting physical infrastructure security still matters. Um, and we, we're still doing a lot of that work as well. Um, and, you know, I would just say at the outset, CISA has two kind of broad missions uh, that have evolved over time. The first is we serve as the national coordinator for the U.S. government's work on critical infrastructure security and resilience. So that means working across multiple agencies that have responsibility for uh, preparing U.S. infrastructure for the threats and risks we face. So the Department of Energy for the energy uh, infrastructure, power, oil and gas, and others. The Department of Treasury for their work with the financial services sector. Um, uh, bring all of that together to make sure that we have uh, a degree of unity of effort, and more importantly, that we are um, maximizing benefits the government can provide. The second major mission uh, that we have, uh, which is the more recent one, but frankly is the one that is uh, tends to be dominant today, and that is serving as the civilian cyber defense agency for the U.S. government. Um, so we have a lot of responsibility working uh, to protect the .gov, so the federal civilian executive branch departments and agencies. Uh, there are 101 of them from the 
big well known ones like the Department of Justice and Department of State, uh, down to small micro agencies like the Marine Mammal Commission that also uh, have the responsibility for managing and securing their own uh, IT networks and maybe of interest to our adversaries. Uh, we also do a substantial amount of work with the private sector, with our state and local governments to help them be prepared for the cyber threats that we are facing. Uh, so we offer technical assistance and best practices. We offer technical services like on-site assessments and scanning people's attack surface to look for the same vulnerabilities that our attackers and our adversaries are looking for. Um, bring people together for operational coordination and planning, whether it's ahead of a crisis or whether it's after one has already uh, happened to make sure that all the information uh, that can be shared is being shared um, and that it's being put to real operational uh, value. And so um, I think five years ago, there was a decision by Congress that uh, CISA and its predecessor organizations had outgrown its headquarters function at the Department of Homeland Security and that our operational role um, needed to be recognized the same way other major operational elements of DHS exist, like FEMA, the Coast Guard, TSA, uh, or Customs and Border Protection. And so CISA was, was born five years ago. Uh, technically next week, I think is our fifth uh, official birthday. Um, so we have grown a lot, uh, even in the last five years. I think the work we did to support uh, the uh, election community in the wake of 2016 and, and to be prepared for 2020 and, and subsequent elections kind of put us on a map in a much bigger way. Uh, but we've got a lot more work to do and are extremely busy right now. It, from what you have just described, it seems to be yet non-expert in this field that you interface with the, in the kind of very private sector, heavy, uh, very distributed country like ours, uh, the health sector divided up into local and state uh, uh, based uh, governmental entities and, and hospital and medical operations, private, many in the private sector, that you, what you just described, means that you interface with that vast private sector IT infrastructure out there from a protective standpoint in two ways. Through the other departments and agencies of government that have the respect, their respective sectors as kind of clients, as well as directly with them. How does the directly with them part work? That would seem to be very operational. Yes, and so it, it's, that is gonna happen in a couple of uh, different ways. So we do a lot of work uh, to kind of organize the various critical infrastructure sectors of our country and under presidential policy directive, there are 16 of them and we work with each of those 16 to um, make sure that we are talking to the right people. Um, uh, and we have, are gaining the perspective and the insights of leadership in those sectors as we inform how government is going to approach them and as we continue to mature and develop government plans for improving our security. Um, uh, we, as you know, work with the uh, other agencies uh, under law, those are now called sector risk management agencies, so HHS for the health sector, for example. Um, we work with them because they have incredible touch points. Uh, they have a lot of expertise with the challenges that those sectors are facing. Often what those sector risk management agencies lack is the cyber expertise, and that's what we are bringing uh, to bear in, in a much more significant way. Um, but we also interface directly, as you know, so CISA has several hundred personnel deployed across the country, uh, both physical protective security advisors and cybersecurity advisors, whose responsibility is to be that direct interface in the field um, with our critical infrastructure, with owners and operators directly, make sure that they're connected back, back to expertise we have here at headquarters, um, but also provide them directly some of the services. So our uh, advisors in the field can conduct assessments. Uh, they can help uh, ensure that they are tied into the training opportunities, help them get access to exercises and others. Um, and, and just work to make sure that they have the right support, including connectivity with other agencies if they, uh, if, they, if they need it. A lot of our work in the field, particularly after an incident, is done in close coordination with other partners like the FBI, um, uh, and where we are bringing our own unique authorities and expertise, and often all of those authorities and expertise are needed 
uh, to provide the type of assistance that a, a, a victim may realize. The last point I'll raise, which how we interface, um, is looking for the ability to scale solutions. And so I'll use an example in the water sector. We have in this country 150,000 water utilities, some very big, some very, very, very small. There are 150,000 of them. Getting 150,000 water utilities to do anything, that is hard. Um, but there are probably only a dozen technology companies that provide support to all 150,000 water utilities. And so we have built deep relationships with the major technology companies, major cybersecurity firms, IT, uh, uh, cloud companies, uh, major vendors of, of critical IT and operational technology equipment, so that if we need to fix a problem, it is far easier to fix it with 12 companies than it is to fix it with 150,000 utilities. And so that is where we are looking at how do we scale um, so security solutions in a way that meets the scale of our critical infrastructure, which is so big. You know, when I go overseas and talk to some of uh, our counterpart agencies um, in countries like Israel or Singapore um, that are really small and you know, they could fit there um, uh, in Israel itself, they've got one floor and one building at their, um, at their national cyber directorate that has the security operations center for their power grid and their water utilities and their nuclear plants. They're all in one floor of one building. Um, uh, those are challenges there that, you know, that their scale allows them to do something like that. We have to think of other solutions given the, the scale of our country and the diversity of our critical infrastructure, the patchwork of laws that govern the security across states and, and, and counties. Um, and some of the ways we do that is by partnering with different groups of private sector because they give us visibility. They give us the ability to, um, to implement and scale solutions that no one can do by themselves. The typical federal roles, uh, like standard setting and certification, uh, the, are those involved in part of your repertory? Because what you just described sounds like it goes way beyond and much more, again, we use the word operational interface mm -hmm. with developers of software, operators of, of cyber control systems and so forth, or critical infrastructure. Yeah, so um, this is part of the complexity of our infrastructure is that there are, in some cases, uh, regulatory standards in some sectors for security and not for others. Uh, so there are fairly um, intense cybersecurity regulations for the financial sector. There are uh, fairly strong uh, cybersecurity standards for elements of our bulk power system that are set by FERC through the uh, and uh, through NERC, uh, which is the North American Energy Reliability Corporation. Uh, but a lot of sectors don't have clear standards. Now, uh, don't have don't have regulations. Now, there are um, there are standards and best practices out there. Um, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology produces a lot of uh, high quality standards on uh, various cybersecurity controls. We work very closely with them, um, using a lot of our expertise to help inform. Uh, what they develop. Um, you know, one of our uh, subject matter experts helped write the one that is published on zero trust architectures and what that means, what are the standards uh, for that. Um, but putting out a standard out there is not enough in our environment. Um, in particular, when you start talking about 150,000 water utilities or uh, thousands of hospitals, including ones that are small, um, they don't have the organic expertise and often the resources to be able to consume and start implementing complex standards uh, like the ones that are detailed in NIST special publications. And so part of what CISA tries to do is, and a lot of our, um, particularly our products like this and the, and the engagement that's happening in the field uh, with our advisors is helping them um, take what is often a very complicated subject in a very under-resourced under environment to say, what should you do first? How should you prioritize your activities in, in the cyber domain to give you the biggest bang for your buck? Um, and so our assessments um, and the technical support we provide uh, is far more operational and it's designed to give them a baseline of cybersecurity that they may not have otherwise. Um, and I think the more we do that bit by bit, uh, the stronger we are. Uh, many, 
of our adversaries, certainly the ones, uh, the criminal organizations that conduct ransomware attacks, they are looking for low hanging fruit. They are looking at scale. So they're, they're trolling the internet, looking for any vulnerability because they're looking to compromise hundreds of potential victims with the hope that a small number will pay. Uh, so the more you're doing to kind of lock your doors and close your windows, the more likely it is that adversaries like that will, will pass you by. And even when it comes to more sophisticated adversaries like nation states, like the Russians and the Chinas, there's a relatively small number of entities that they're going to dedicate a substantial amount of time to, to actually compromise. Um, in a lot of other cases, they're going to be looking for those same easy to exploit vulnerabilities in the devices that sit on the edge of the internet, um, between the internet and, and a network. Um, and so the more you're doing to kind of put in place the basics of cybersecurity, uh, the better you're protected. And so a lot of what the work that we are doing operationally, a lot of work that we are doing uh, as part of that operational collaboration, those partnerships that we've developed are designed to give ourselves a better chance of, of avoiding an attack, uh, spotting it earlier on so you can get, get, get it out of your network and building relationships that allow us to take um, remediative steps quickly before the full impacts of, a, of an incident are felt. Okay. This may take you, I'm not sure, out of your comfort zone, but what you described as CISA's responsibilities focused on mainly domestic departments of the federal government, even the State Department obviously has an overseas responsibility and so forth. The, the, the departments and agencies of our government, more or less here on shore, and the huge private sector out there and other governmental entities the, and the federal scheme at the state and local level um, is largely defensive. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how you think about the role of CISA in the context of cyber warfare. The old maxim of war is that the best defense is good offense, but in the world of cyber, you seem to be saying, or the actions seem to betray the idea that fundamental to our posture in cyber warfare is a good defense. Yeah, so you know, I think that these are these are kind of two sides of the same coin. Uh, we need to improve our defense because that level of deterrence, the ability to complicate the adversary's planning for that they're likely to be successful um, is critical for their decision-making in future conflict. So, uh, you know, you mentioned planning for potential future conflict with China. Um, uh, as we think about what China wants to achieve in uh, in their conflict and how they think about using cyber as a tool in that conflict. Um, in February of this year, the Director of National Intelligence published their annual threat assessment. Um, and the language they used on this is actually fairly stark. Uh, they said that in the event of conflict, uh, China will target domestic US critical infrastructure for the purposes of disruptive and destructive attacks. Um, that they will do so for a few reasons, including interfering with the movement of uh, military support to Asia, um, but also to sow societal panic inside the United States. Uh, and we have seen evidence of this in terms of where China is compromising US critical infrastructure, things that have no legitimate intelligence value and whose only purpose would be to cause disruptions in the very fabric of, of uh, American society. Uh, our ability to, and they want to do that to affect U.S. geopolitical freedom of action and affect our decision making during a crisis. The more we can protect ourselves, the more we can stop them from being successful and, and their belief that they will be successful, it may complicate their own belief about the success of military activity against Taiwan or others. Um, so that's one piece. Why, did, why we believe the defense is so important. But um, we work extremely closely with U.S. Cyber Command, which has the offensive cybersecurity mission for the U.S. government. Um, and uh, there is a lot of information sharing back and forth because the work that we do defensively informs what they're going to do offensively and vice versa. So I'll give a good example from uh, actually from the 2020 election that is uh, earlier this year, we worked with Cyber Command and uh, declassified and gave a presentation at a conference on how what this looked like. Um, CyberCom was, was in the midst of conducting an operation overseas against a um, hostile nation. 
As part of that, they detected that that adversary had compromised a uh, local jurisdiction inside the United States, uh, including um, the business systems of an election office. Uh, so not anything directly affecting the election, but they were inside of an election administration. Um, and they let us know. We then went on site and performed uh, help to support the victim in that case. As part of our work with that victim, we identified additional activity by that same adversary, passed that back to Cybercom, and they used that to expand the scope of their offensive actions against, uh, against that threat actor, disrupting a wider array of its uh, nefarious activities. And so um, we are doing that, frankly, every day when it comes to ransomware operators, as we identify new critical nodes that are being used by ransomware operators to conduct attacks against the United States. That information is being fed to Cybercom and they're taking action against uh, uh, those criminal organizations. And so we have looked at this and said, this is not a one or other, you need both. Um, and both of those things need to be working in sync to maximize their benefits. Um, and so that's what we've been working on for the past several years to really mature and hone that uh, to what it's like today. Well, you took the word out of my mouth, Cybercom. I was about to ask you how you work with Cybercom and you described that. I think very, uh, very succinctly and, and clearly for us and the interactions between your responsibilities and theirs. Let me dolly back from that just a little bit to the back to the private sector for a second to ask, uh, well, in your efforts to mobilize and uh, in form, raise awareness, raise performance standards if you would for private sector operators in this uh, in, in the cyber security domain. Um, what are you relying on in a sense for your ultimate authority? I don't mean statutory authority, but your real ability to to secure their cooperation. Is is it working, in other words, to to persuade them that look, this is in your own best interest. Uh, it's in your shareholders' interest, your customers' interest, the industry's interest, the nation's interest, um, because, as a former federal official myself, uh, there was an old saying of Ronald Reagan that some of the most feared words in the English language is where I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help. Uh, um, uh, do you, uh, you know, that often provokes a skeptical response. Do you get a not skeptical response? Uh, you know, I think you can imagine that in with a critical infrastructure as diverse as we have, we are going to get every response under the sun. Um, uh, so let me start by saying, um, if you look at the national cyber strategy that was released earlier this year by the White House, uh, it reflects that um, irrespective of whether people are willing to work with the government, we have not generated, uh, we're not having all the security outcomes we want with a uh, an approach that has been largely focused on securing voluntary cooperation. Uh, and so it is seeking to kind of rebalance that uh, in part by expanding uh, US government regulatory authority over cybersecurity to ensure minimum standards across other critical infrastructure. Um, that work is started already in large part by utilizing authorities that already existed within the federal government but had not yet been fully utilized. So for example, the Transportation Security Administration started using authority it had but had not deployed to uh, require minimum cybersecurity standards in uh, various elements that it can regulate like pipelines, airlines, uh, airports, uh, rail systems. Um, other regulatory authority may require Congress to act and that will happen uh, if, if Congress is willing to do so. Um, that being said, um, we do get a lot of cooperation. Uh, we work every day with critical infrastructure country in part because um, we are showing them value. And I think ultimately that's what the private sector is looking for. Uh, they, they don't want to work with someone who is um, asking a lot and giving a little. Um, and so we have, uh, we show up with the right degree of humility. Uh, that they know more than us about their systems and uh, their infrastructure, uh, but that we have something to contribute to, something to add that they don't have, and our expertise can help them. So the 
uh, best tool we have to expand that partnership is not us going out there and saying we're from the government, we're going to be a partner. Uh, that's generally our, our language. Uh, but it is to have other members of the private sector talk about the value that they have received and benefited from from working with us. Um, and I think that type of trying to, you know, using a modern colloquialism can go viral. Um, we want there to be viral energy about the benefits of working uh, with the government on cybersecurity issues. And I think um, in part because companies are looking at the environment, they're looking at major companies, you know, big and small from you know, colonial pipeline to MGM to small little municipal uh, water systems and hospitals being hit by cyber attacks today. And they recognize that clearly they don't have all the answers um, and that if we can help, uh, they should take us up on it. Uh, that is often hard in the midst of an incident when their general counsels are often telling them to uh, be skeptical of working with the government. But I would say uh, we have built a high degree of trust over the past 18 years working with critical infrastructure across this country um, and will continue to do so. If there are places where we're not getting enough uh, support in a, in a voluntary way, you know, eventually there may be a regulatory environment, but um, that's not really CISA's role. We're not the regulator in almost any context. Um, our job is to be that trusted voice, uh, to create the forum, to bring together the private sector and the government um, in, in real true partnership, real true operational collaboration. Um, and where people have seen that, we have continued to get more and more interest of working with us. Okay. I know that you've got a hard stop at 10. We want to have some time for questions from the floor. Absolutely. So I'd like to just briefly touch on two more things and okay. then open the floor to questions. Uh, the first is uh, the eruption last month now, going on for almost a month. A month later today. No, um, the Israel Hamas conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, uh, effects, what knock on effects from that conflict uh, are you anticipating coping with, trying to help uh, uh, your, if you would, constituency in the United States cope with uh, now that this war is upon us, upon the international? Yeah, so um, really important question, and I think this uh, conflict, um, the outgrowth of the conflict bears on kind of both sides of the CISA mission. So uh, the day after the Hamas attack against Israel, uh, we had already started doing outreach to faith-based organizations across this country, knowing that when there is conflict in the Middle East, uh, there is often a rise in threats <clears throat> and violence. Uh, against uh, faith-based organizations inside the United States. Um, so we had built a, we have a long history of working with that community. Um, we have a number of, of tools. We provide them everything from uh, active shooter training to de-escalation training for people who uh, may be troubled to come into places of worship. Um, and those, are, those are DHS responsibilities, not specific. Sister's no, this is sister's responsibility. So our, our folks are the ones in the field making contact with these faith-based organizations uh, across the country. Um, those are our protective security advisors uh, who are doing it. In many cases, providing the training um, uh, and or making sure that they're connected to our resources. So that work started that weekend. We we're already on, on phone calls with uh, faith-based organizations. And that work continues. Uh, we've, we've gotten requests now from school districts because of threats of violence um, in those communities. And so we are doing a lot of work uh, there. So that work is, is going to continue as long as we have the demand from our partners across this country. On the cyber side, um, there's kind of two pieces of what we're working on. Uh, the first is kind of working with our private sector partners, particularly those companies that have the broadest visibility what's happening in the cyber ecosystem, the large cloud technology uh, vendors out there, the Microsofts, the Googles, the Amazons, um, uh, to understand, is the threat environment changing? Are we seeing a change in, uh, uh, is there more Iranian activity against uh, victims uh, outside of the outside of Israel? Um, you know, right now, we have not really seen an uptick in cyber activity against the West. Um, 
and that's the that's the judgment from uh, both what we have seen, what our other partners have seen, and what we are receiving from our intelligence community partners. Uh, but we are constantly on guard for that. Uh, that could change quickly, um, and uh, I think if the conflict spreads, it may increase the likelihood that we could see cyber attacks against us here at home and and in the right before the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, we launched a Shields Up campaign to say, be ready for potential retaliation against the United States. Um, we haven't done that in this case because we haven't seen the, the threat profile justify that, but um, we are kind of constantly looking to do that. The last piece of what we're doing in the cyber domain is we have a long-standing and close relationship with our counterparts in Israel. Um, and so we are working very closely with, with them, uh, utilizing information that we can glean uh, about uh, potential threats that they are facing in Israel, um, uh, things that are happening uh, from the array of hacktivists and, and Hamas-affiliated uh, cyber actors and, and others who are either threatening or directly targeting Israel today. Um, and so nearly every day we're in contact with, with them, making sure that they have the support that they need to be successful in battling back what is um, extremely aggressive and broad uh, cyber attacks uh, hitting Israel right now. Um, but Israel is a very, very capable cyber actor. They have um, uh, both a sophisticated government uh, operation to counter cyber threats and a very vibrant uh, private sector uh, cybersecurity ecosystem there. Um, and so uh, they are prepared, but um, it, it, is, it is a lot. And we are working to make sure that we can provide whatever support we have. Well, let me combine two last two two questions in one to sure. cover the both an implication of this uh, Middle East conflict that you've spoken of and uh, the last topic I wanted to cover social media. Uh, in the realm of social media, of course, uh, a preoccupation nowadays mm -hmm. very much is disinformation. Uh, social media is perhaps the most highly distributed of all the realms. Is uh, so a question that arises is, you know, is, is, does this have a, a, a role or is this a carving out a role for itself in uh, dealing with disinformation, particularly in the social media context? But what you just said about uh, the Middle East provokes the realization that, well, there are impassioned people including inside the United States, uh, about inflamed on one side or the other of the Israel-Hamas war, uh, who might be tempted to make their point of disagreement with U.S. policy or even impede U.S. activity in support of Israel uh, by, well, attacks through the Internet. Um, can you talk about both of those things a little bit? Sure. So um, we don't have a direct role on uh, the disinformation that is playing out with respect to the conflict um, in Israel. There or are, reading anything else. I, I, we have a little bit of in focus on elections, uh, mm -hmm. where we do a lot of work on election security. So we, we do have some efforts that help to educate people on the tactics of foreign disinformation, how the foreign adversaries wants to sow discord associated with um, uh, U.S. election processes. We put out accurate information. We have sort of a, a, a web page called Rumor Control uh, Election Security Rumor versus Reality during the 2020 election that we still operate to provide um, as accurate information as we can about how elections are conducted to, to um, address disinformation narratives that may be uh, out there in part because elections are extremely complicated, very decentralized, operated differently, and so it's ripe for disinformation. We do a lot of work to help amplify the voices of local election officials, but when it comes to a conflict overseas and the disinformation coming out of it, um, some of that work is happening from the State Department through their Global Engagement Center that has a broader responsibility on, on foreign disinformation, um, and obviously uh, the FBI has a responsibility for dealing with uh, foreign disinformation targeting the United States attempts to actually disrupt that. So uh, if we have intelligence that uh, Russian threat actors are using disinformation and created a bot army to do X on Facebook, uh, there's ways in which the FBI can get that information to Facebook so that uh, Facebook is aware and can take action if that, if that um, uh, activity violates their terms of service. Um, but uh, you are you are right on the last point, which is um, 
the, the actors who can be involved in cyber come in all sh shapes and sizes. And so we obviously have nation states who are looking to exploit the circumstance to conduct attacks against Israel. Um, Israel and Iran have been in a tit for tat cyber conflict for several years. Um, you have seen it play out publicly with disruptions uh, in both countries. Um, and events like this only spur that to kind of greater heights. Uh, but you also have uh, uh, kind of what we broadly call kind of hacktivists, which are kind of unaffiliated um, actors who have some technical acumen and have the ability to uh, cause uh, disruptions or challenges. Uh, often they don't have a high degree of technical capability, so they often do low level cyber attacks like defacing web pages or uh, small scale denial of service attacks where they you know, may increase the latency on a website by a little bit. Um, but that, that activity is kind of pervasive across the internet. Um, it is the most easily addressed and tends to be more of a nuisance than, than a real uh, threat. Um, and so I think part of what uh, we are, are trying to do is, is kind of look at that environment and say, can we separate what's real from, from what's a nuisance? Um, are we seeing an uptake in those actual real cyber threats or, or not yet? Um, and what can we provide to the Israelis to help them deal with the kind of full gamut of threat they're facing from all of these actors and everything in, in between? Um, and that's a, that's a full-time job. Thank you. That, I think, has been a very comprehensive presentation. This has been all about questions, but we need to get to your questions. So could I call for questions from the floor, uh, Ambassador Sam? <clears throat> What's your assessment of the Israelis' ability to block and shoot down at the same time? Since they're they're probably with two to three fronts opening up, cyber attacks, um, and all the other stuff we can't talk about in this company. Uh, this is going to be an incredible lift for anyone, much less a small country like Israel, uh, without going into classified information. What's your general sense of uh, how much more they can take uh, before we need to step in uh, from a kinetic standpoint? I know we've already stepped in in all other in all other regimes, but from a kinetic standpoint, and really provide them some cover fire, for lack of a better term. Uh, um, well, some of that question I, I think is uh, even above my pay grade uh, to be able to to answer, but. I will say that um, we work with many countries around the world uh, closely on cybersecurity issues. Uh, we are meeting with our counterparts around the world um, nearly every day on various cybersecurity threats. Um, is Israel is among the most capable in the world when it comes to cybersecurity, both defensive and offensively. Not just in their category, but in but writ large. Writ large. Okay. They are among the most capable actors in the world, defensively and offensively. And they have capacity. Now, every country can hit its limit. I don't know where Israel's is, um, but um, there are many other countries that I would not have as much confidence in if this was happening to them. Um, so time will tell whether uh, you know they can sustain the pace because uh, I know from, from some of the conversations with their our counterparts there, <clears throat> they are full time across the board, um, and that will weigh on on anyone. Um, but they have a deep edge and a lot of capability and a lot of capacity. So um, in that sense, uh, they are as prepared as any other country in the planet to to deal with what they are facing. Ambassador Sands and then Ambassador Bassamer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wales. Um, I was excited to come to this conference for about a month, looking forward to it. But this week, in front of the Judiciary Committee, I learned that CISA was censoring Americans' free speech, which I believe is unconstitutional, working with universities like Stanford, working with the GEC, even the sitting U.S. president. True information was censored. I'd like to know what you have to say about that under your watch. Yeah, so uh, we have been very clear that we have never censored anyone's speech or facilitated censorship. Uh, social media companies 
make their own determinations of what information they will allow on their platforms. Uh, so I'll just provide very briefly you know, what I believe is the kind of crux of the issue, which is in 2018 and 2020, as part of our election security mission and at the request of state and local governments, we forwarded along to social media platforms um, a relatively small number of uh, examples or cases where state and local election officials believed that the information was inaccurate um, or was disinformation or misinformation to the social media companies. We did that without regard to who was sending it to us as long as they were state and local election officials. So many of them came from uh, Republican elected secretaries of state, or Democrat elected secretaries of state, and professional election uh, administrators. And uh, with the caveat that you should take whatever action you deem appropriate, but we are not asking for any action to be taken. Um, and in the 2020 election, we did that about 200 times. So out of millions of tweets, state and local election officials sent us about 200 to forward along to local election officials. That activity stopped at the end of the 2020 election cycle and has not happened again. We didn't think that, we didn't think that, that program was adding a lot of value and forwarding <coughs> emails is not a critical activity to persist in the form. Um, again, we know for a fact that the local, that the social media companies did not take action on all the things that we forwarded to them on behalf of state and local election officials. They did in some, they didn't in others. Um, it was, their determination about what was going to be on their platform and what violated their terms of service. Um, and uh, yeah, but in terms of, I think that there's been a lot of inaccurate information about the relationship between CISA and other entities uh, like Stanford and others. Um, but they were, those are other private organizations uh, doing what they thought was best um, and not the direction of CISA. So uh, we think it, um, we will continue to provide accurate information to members of Congress about what we did and what we are doing today. Um, but we are confident that um, uh, we have never censored anyone's speech. Yeah. Ambassador DeSombra, and then I think we're right up against it for your hard stop. Okay, quick question. Let's assume, unfortunately, we actually are in a, a true kinetic war of some sort. In that circumstance, how does CISA and Cybercom work together? It's a bit strange if one thinks of CISA as having an important actual national security defense. It's not like we've got a defensive army and an offensive army sort of separate, which are all part of one. How would that work actually in a real conflict in that circumstance? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the truth is it's going to work a lot like it's, it's, it's working today. Um, uh, because we already are on the receiving end of many attacks from, from foreign nations. Um, as I noted, China is already compromising US critical infrastructure to preposition for future conflict. And so as we are working with those entities that we can identify that were um, compromised uh, by the Chinese, you know, that information is being shared with other U.S. government entities who can use it for other missions, whether those are future intelligence gathering work by the intelligence community, whether that is uh, planning for future cyber operations by Cybercom, whether that is working with their FBI colleagues who may use this information as part of counterintelligence or uh, other law enforcement investigations. Um, there are, uh, each of us have unique capabilities, each of, each of us have unique authorities that we need to execute. Um, and that needs to be done in as synchronized a way as possible to make sure that we are uh, we are successful. Um, it is it is extremely um, uh, it will be extremely important that that continues to happen in, in the wake of a of a real conflict because the operational pace, uh, the tempo, our need to move quickly from defensive to offensive uh, will be essential. Um, you know, there are things that we, you know, we don't do, that we don't have the authority to do, uh, which is what Cybercom is there for. Uh, the work that we do domestically, they don't have the authority for. And so it's a matter of bringing those two together as closely as possible, um, uh, along with the rest of the interagency uh, to, to give the government all the tools it needs um, so that the United States uh, can prevail in whatever conflict it is in. One more time. Uh, 
I, I was going to say, I didn't want to make it late. Considering that you said um, it, it, it would work the way it's been working, it begs the question of, is it working? In introducing you, I mentioned your role, uh, CISA's role in combating those celebrated ransomware attacks of, of like, um, uh, um, uh, yeah, the Colonial Pipeline was one of the, the major ones. Uh, um, and, uh, um, sorry, I can't say this. Uh, Kaseya and um, uh, solar winds. Um, but we haven't heard reports of such things since. Is that just because the reporting suppressed or are they not happening? Um, you know, I would say that more strategically, the answer is yes. It is working better now than ever. Um, in terms of interagency cooperation, it is night and day from where it was five years ago. Uh, and even in the last two years, the relationship between us, the FBI, NSA, um, is um, incredibly strong and tight. The amount of collaboration that we are doing every single day um, on both cyber preparedness and actual threats is um, really encouraging to see. Um, when it comes to you know big attacks, we you know we're still seeing some big ransomware. Obviously, I mentioned you know MGM uh, hack from. Uh, Recently, that being said, um, we have made progress, um, but you know, ransomware is a really challenging, challenging problem, uh, just because it is the, the, the threat is so effusive, uh, it is so widespread, um, and they are looking for any weakness that they can find. And in a country as big as ours, with critical infrastructure as broad as ours, there is always going to be. Vulnerabilities for them to find. Um, I think we have worked really hard to try to minimize the chances of significant cyber attacks against critical infrastructure that would cause real disruptions to Americans' white life. Do you have a second to accommodate that? Yeah, go ahead. Just, just a quick, uh, a quick question. Uh, one, thing I, one thing that I learned when I was in Vienna was the concept of hybrid warfare. Uh, you know, Americans are trained to see a war. When it breaks out, and we know it when we see it. It's in Ukraine, it's in Israel, that's war. Um, but the concept of hybrid warfare is that you're in conflict over a broad range of attacks. Um, I take the position we are actually in a world war and have been in a world war for a long time. You've described attacks on this country through, high, through uh, critical infrastructure attacks from these various adversaries. Do you have any public? messaging strategy you may just be an observer of this as opposed to an implementer but is there a public communication strategy to explain to the american people the deal we're actually in because i think that you were talking today and we hear it all the time that these cyber attacks are just a nuisance this is something we just got to kind of stamp down like stepping on an insect somewhere or something like that but actually it's a continuous part of an overall strategy against this in continuing war is there any public communication to this effect that's under discussion anywhere, either in your agency or the Department of Homeland Security? I've not seen any messaging uh, exactly as you described. I think we, we are becoming, I think as we talk publicly, more clear about the nature of the cyber threats that we're facing um, and that nation states are looking to hold our critical infrastructure at risk and they are trying to do that today by getting in, establishing presence so that at the time and place they're choosing, they can disrupt Americans' life. Now. We're being more clear about that than we've ever were in the past. Um, and I think we, in particularly in our communication to the owners and operators of that critical infrastructure, we're trying to be more clear that they are on the front lines of this conflict, which, as you know, um, for us, doesn't have a clear start or clear end. Uh, you know, we often say, you know, we think about, we talk about, let's say, conflict with China in a kind of competition, crisis, conflict stage. But I would argue that in cyber, those delineations don't really apply. You know, a crisis will look like either hot competition or, or cold conflict and, and, uh, uh, so we don't have the luxury of waiting for kind of clear delineation about when we go to the next step um, in, a, in a potential uh, uh, 
crisis conflict with, with some of our adversaries because they are going to be constantly looking for ways to get into our critical infrastructure, cause disruptions. They're going to be using things like disinformation operations to sow discord within the United States. Uh, that is pervasive um, and everyone has a role to play in that, whether it is individuals when it comes to being susceptible to disinformation from, from foreign adversaries, whether it is businesses that have corporate cyber responsibility uh, to do what they can to make sure that this country is protected, whether they are an operator of critical infrastructure, they're making insecure software that is being used by thousands of other critical infrastructure sites, and obviously the government has an important role to play here. I think our language is becoming more clear on that, but I don't know that yet we've described it in as clear terms as you just did, but I would say the messaging here continues to, uh, to evolve. Brandon, there's so much more we could cover, so much more we have to learn, but thank you for taking this time, even making you late, uh, to get on your way. Thanks so much for your support.